Yeah, so as, as we'll say in uh, off air, my plaque came in the mail and, um, you know, competitions where I make money. I entered into three songwriting competitions last year in 2020 because I thought I'll give it a go and I felt ready to do it. But um, it can be a money-making business at times. What do you think about that? I think you've got a good point, actually. I mean, if you've sometimes if you do the mathematics and if they're expecting it, but it's a worldwide competition mm. and they're charging you a 25, 30 bucks an entry fee yeah. and it's got a healthy prize money, uh, maybe 10, 20 grand or whatever. But you realize if uh, 50,000 people enter, let's say mm. at $30 a pop, that means for the entry fee alone, they're getting $1.5 million. Because APRA, I entered into the uh, Harry Vander uh, songwriting competition. Andrew Young, yeah. Yeah. That mm-hmm. was about 50 bucks, but I, I didn't get any placing. Um, I did yeah. one in America. I think it was the ISC songwriting competition. I made it to the semifinals, but again, um, didn't get there. So this is the first time I've ever won a prize. So. Well, yeah, but the thing is, I'm... I'm the the APRA one at 50 bucks a pop, you probably realize mm. that there's a very limited amount of people who would do that, mm. who would qualify. First, you have to be an APRA member as far as I know. Mm. So it's a very low, very small amount of people. Plus, you actually are going to have to um, pay people to administer it mm. and to run it. And you've got to hire people and then you've got to award the prize money. So the APRA one at $50, I can understand one of these worldwide things that um, will will get hundreds and hundreds of thousands of entries Mm. and um, they'll make an absolute packet on it. And, you know, that's, that's, I suppose you, you enter with both eyes open Mm. um, into these sorts of things, but but I would very rarely now apply to a competition that requires a steep entry fee. I think 20 to 25 is enough. Um, and always be aware of the fact that they reserve the right not to award a prize. Mm. When you can think of, you know, $25 a pop for 50,000 people. Mm. All right. So that's a lot of money goes in there and they don't have to administer a prize. Exactly. They keep all the money. So you got to be you got to be wary of them. There are certain established and well established competitions that you become aware of, and you those are terrific to enter. APRA being one of them, um, but there are others that you know, fly by night productions um, with, in association with white knuckle uh, seat um, warmers productions presents a, a, a prize for the funniest song about lemmings mm. you know and 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 suddenly you also have to be worried about not just those sorts of fly by night things one offs but also competitions that change their rules regularly um that re- in the classical area that require very specific mm. instrumentation um, and then only award a prize to something that's already been written and performed with that in mind, with that instrumentation. And you start to think it's almost as if the judges said that piece deserves a prize. Let's change the everything so that it looks like this piece was made for this competition, whereas in fact the competition was made for the piece. Yeah, And that's happened on more than one occasion. I, that, I, that's the thing you've got to be wary of. I would go back to them. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I remember in my undergrad, it was my head teacher, sort of, he wasn't a big fan of the of the Harry Vander and all that. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, I sort of used it. I just wanted to get my work out there. But, um, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, there are, there's, I mean, probably the best way to get your work out there is either, well, now it's, it's to have some sort of digital presence mm. online presence or if it's a bit more if you need instruments then you know from make friends um the best friends you're ever going to have are the ones you went through uni with mm. you went through conservatorium with or met afterwards um through that i mean the people who who regularly play my music are friends first um and foremost they're people i know um and 
you know, because I'm not famous enough to have people hear about me. Uh, I th I keep thinking, uh, although <laughs> although I do get at least once or twice a week, someone says, "Oh, you're Houston Dunley," and and you think, well, you know, it's a name that you can't forget, really. That's one. That's one thing about being saddled with a name like that. Once you've learned it, that's it. Mm. But you know, you, you you make your friends, and 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 very often one will say, "Well, do you write anything for my instrument?" And so, well, as a matter of fact, um, or if somebody says, "Do you, do you have anything?" I, I, I said, "No, but would you like me to write something?" So you you, you don't push. You, you you collaborate and you you you, you have fun. Um, and you become perfectly normal and uh, interactive with someone. There was, um, there's also the thing that uh, just, just last week uh, on Melbourne Composers League, they put up a, an, uh, an interview with me about a piece called the Concord Duet, mm -hmm. which is for flute and clarinet. And that happened to come out of an experience of actually staying with a couple, um, Garrett and Melissa, and they were so nice to each other, and they they lived in such harmony as husband and wife, and they had a baby, and everything was discussed and agreed, and it was all lovely. So they lived in harmony, in Concord, if you like, you know, but they also lived in Concord in New South Wales, and so there, there was a day or I had a day off one of those odd things that you have every now and then. And I decided I'd write a piece mm -hmm. for them in that day while they were out. And um, my computer decided that it, that was the time it was going to pack it in. Uh, so I wrote the piece with uh, gasp, pencil and paper, nice. which I had some around. Wow, what an old fashioned, old school stuff. <laughs> so this, this, that's why it's the length it is. It probably would have been a longer piece had I written it you know, on computer, more productive. But in, in another way, doing it in pencil and paper was a good discipline. And it was a four minute, it's about a four minute piece. It's had a few performances. Uh, they played it when they came home that night. Mm. And they played it, had a kind of a slow read through it. And it was, oh, this piece works. So it got its premiere down here in Melbourne, uh, in St. Jude's and Carlton. A couple of years ago and it's been performed a couple of other places but no I, that that's a different thing where you just find this what can you do to say thank you to people who've been so nice to you well you write a you write them something that um what uh, nice. software are you using you you're a finale i use dorico yep um when i'm not using pencil and paper <laughs> i use uh i use finale <laughs> yeah, yeah. I start the reason and the, the only reason I use Finale um well is because one day I hope they'll actually come and offer me a deal to say that I use Finale. Um, but that's never happened in the 30 years or so that I've been doing it. Finale burst onto the scene back in you ready for this 1987. Wow, shit. Which may have been before you were born. When were you born? No, uh, 93. Oh yeah, Finale was 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 good by then. Serious. Yeah, it was good by then. In 1987, it was terrible. I and mean, like most, it didn't have much competition because people didn't know what they were doing. There were a few others out there like uh, professional composer, Cakewalk, and so on. And they weren't that great. You know, let's face it. Um, they didn't do an awful lot for you. If you didn't want, if you wanted to write something that had more than four lines or was more than just something and piano or a song and a lead sheet, you really were out of luck. And Finale came along saying, we can give you orchestral scores. And so the early Finale scores, you can see them. For example, Barry Cunningham's um, Vast, mm. one of the first Australian pieces written in Finale. Um, and it is vast. The piece is enormous. It's, it's it more than fits on, it's more than can fit on a CD. Um, it's about 90 minutes, 95 minutes or so. And it was involved seven different dance companies and was played all over Australia in every, in every city. So it was an amazing coup for him. But he wrote the score in finale and there was an awful lot of problems with it. I mean, I, I was to the um, amanuensis and some of them I was called into basically correct by hand stuff that couldn't be done in finale. Mm. 
But that was back in 1980. Actually, it was pre-87, come to think of it. That was 85. So Finale's been around since about 84, 83, 84. What about Sibelius? Sibelius came along as the, as the I'm snapping at the heels of Finale to make it look good. Um, the, by the time Sibelius came along, I had so much invested in the thought process of Finale and understood the way Finale put its all its music together. Mm. Um, there's basically one golden rule about Finale that I'll tell you in a moment. Um, having to then tear all that down and think a new way for Sibelius, I thought that would get in the way of my productivity. No, fair um, enough. I could do it, but the, the, the simple rule about Finale, um, which is a simple rule, but difficult and complex in, pro, in practice, is remember or know which tool you used in order to put this particular piece of notation together. Mm. Um, that way you can go in and edit. The hard part about finale is editing. Uh, you can main, you know, you can play stuff in all that sort of stuff very quickly, but it's never really that good or accurate compared to what notation might be. Mm. And you've got to go in and edit it. So you need to know what tool you've used and how to edit with that tool. And um, they they come up with updates. Then mostly their updates are good. Um, there's been one bad one in which they froze and they stopped you a being able to take diminuendo and crescendo marking lines and put them in on angles. You had, it was all straight. Yes. And that doesn't always work for notation. And they still haven't fixed that. Um, I guess have there's you, just- Have uh, you looked at uh, moving to Dorico? Is, uh, I have looked at Dorico, but the same thing, I'd have to learn it in a new, I'd have to learn a whole new system and I'm too busy writing stuff to come out you know i and find dorico's uh easy than Sabay. that's what i'm told Finale. that's what i'm told um and the thing is though because i've been doing finale now since as i say since 1985 mm. not 87 we're getting on for oh, a long time uh 35 years or so um it's it's like saying you know drive another car or, or a different kind of car which doesn't have an accelerator or doesn't have a brake you have to use fingers and you know just you can still drive but you know the whole new system takes you a while and it's not that i couldn't learn it i mean i could learn it i don't doubt myself there but i'd stop right I'd, I'd have to stop composing for a while well they've made it where you can that. um you can use your keyboard and it's like you're typing yeah I mean, you do that with finale as well but I found my my work process on Dorico is much quicker than it was on Sibelius because the manual on Sibelius is like what that thick It's just so yeah. confusing. And, yeah, well, you uh, can't, you, yeah, exactly, exactly. Dorico they've simplified it so much, and they got their YouTube channel. They actually, show you. Well, Finale has those sorts of things as well. I'm not trying to set them all up against one another, but they all have uh, tutorials and and so on that are visual for those who are more visually acute attuned to things um finale's entire manual is now online so you just go to the help button and, and you get straight on it how thick is go. it mm. well it's an online so it could be you know it's very thin you know, but, but <laughs> if it's, um if i the last one i don't know if i've got the old one lying around here i'm looking around i don't think i do but it was thick. It was Ugh. doorstep thick. It was doorstep thick. But that's because it can do an awful lot. Hmm. Um, I'm still waiting for the, I'm still waiting for the, um, I think the main thing is that most of us are waiting for the, the MIDI realizations to catch up with Cubase and VST and all those that have really terrific sounds. You can only do so much with Garrett. And, which is the one Finale uses and, and, and the onboard process. They don't sound quite enough mm. like real instruments, for example, to say, well, I can I can you know, pass this off as the London Symphony Orchestra. No, you can't. Um, but it it's it's a great demo. It's still a good demo. And you know, with <coughs> excuse me, 
if you if you do enough with the reverb and sound treatments and so on, it can be fairly convincing to a less discerning ear than yours or mine, or anybody watching this probably. Um, it doesn't doesn't sound too bad, but you you can tell. There's always the digital tells uh, for certain instruments. Yeah, it's better to have your work performed live. I think. Yeah, it's but a better. lot of conductors, a lot of conductors, and a lot of performers really appreciate the fact you could send them something that gives you an idea how it sounds. Um, last, I actually mentioned this maybe last time I was working on this euphonium concerto, mm. um, and I've finished it now since we've 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 last talked. Um, and yeah, it doesn't sound like a brass band sounds it has far less warmth than an actual brass band sound but you send that to the conductor and to the soloist and you say look here's here's the sound and they go oh, okay and then that works at that tempo you know whatever and and it takes some of their it's like listening to a recording i mean i remember reading a conductor book a book by a conductor called eric leinsdorf called the composer's advocate uh, somebody gave it to me for my 21st birthday. I think. Um, I see, I was a nerd even back then. And uh, he says, or well, he was asked, do you listen to the recordings of other conductors? And he said, of course I do. Um, particularly those who conducted it 20, 30 years ago, because I want to hear the piece. I want to hear their version of it. I, I want to learn from that. Mm. You know, I want to learn what works. Much it's a it's a it's a tool that we have, and so this is the in, in some ways the, the the MIDI demo is the is the modern hi-fi recording uh, as as a teaching tool, and so we can we can listen to it, admittedly without the benefit of of human interpretation so much, but we can still hear what it's meant to sound like if it were played by an orchestra of robots, for example. Yeah. Um, but, uh, no, I, I think you, you use those for what they are, use them for their strengths and their strength is that they can, you can send them off as a demo and say, look, here's how it's meant to sound. At least here's how all the notes sound. Um, I'm pretty sure that everything's in range because the course finale, I'm sure Sibelius and Dorico do this as well. Tell you if a note's out of range, mm -hmm. um, Finale has an extra um, thing that it prints them the notes and puts red uh, on their note head if it's outside of like a high school player's range, for example, mm. because there's an awful lot of music written for that age group. And so you don't want to write music that's unplayable mm. for, for a certain grade level or something. Um, Dorico so can, does that too. Yeah. And so that, and then there's a good reason for that because that's a real helpful tool. Because you don't necessarily know all the possible ranges uh, of every instrument for a student who's in pre-tertiary education. Remember uh, Beethoven's time, they never had all this software. They had to know their stuff. Well, they, 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 they learned differently, yes. Um, but you can't say that they, necessarily all went straight onto the page sometimes you have to make changes uh and revisions and a lot of it's recycled you gotta remember that they, you, you're recycling stuff that's already known to work um beethoven had the an interesting advantage we're talking about software it's not really software but it, it's we can we could think of it as 19th century software mm. um he had a friend called Meltzel who I think was Swiss. And Meltzel was, was the, 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 the ultimate tinkerer, the ultimate inventor. And he had a great interest in music. Mm -hmm. So he'd, he'd do things like invent mutes for the piano, you know, things like that, you know, crazy stuff. And Beethoven, because Beethoven was always looking to make a buck, um, would, would invest in some of it. And sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. But there was one spectacular uh, thing that Meltzel invented that did work and that was the metronome mm. and you'll see on those older scores a tempo marking with M dot M 
which means Meltzel metronome. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the, the tempo on the Meltzel metronome, 120 per minute, for example. You don't necessarily see that much now because we don't do use the met, you got digital metronomes, but the concept of the metronome comes from this guy Meltzel. I don't know if Beethoven made a packet on the metronome, but he should have, because uh, it was wildly successful. And it's 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 one of those first sort of teaching aids. But there's also there have also been other forms of software, um, I suppose you could say. Even back in the days of medieval times, we have something like Guido's hand. Yeah. Where you have all of these things actually mean something. I mean, look, there are 12 differences here. There are 12 segments on your four fingers. There's, there's, there's a spot there for every note. There's two octaves here, you know, mm -hmm. two octaves over here. So you could actually, there is a, there's a teaching method that's possible and a learning method that's possible. We are very adept at, as human beings at making things that help us learn. And we're very good at teaching. We're very good at teaching. Uh, we don't, nowadays, I don't think we value it enough, but I think we're, as people, we're very good at, at, at teaching and working out ways of, of learning stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, composers uh, before me, you were born, had to know all their stuff. And, you know, well, they did. They did, but they also had to learn new stuff too. I mean, you can tell when, you can tell when Haydn and Mozart meet. And start to look at each other's music because their music changes. Mm. You can tell when Mozart finds out about Bach because suddenly there's all this counterpoint in his music that wasn't there before. Um, you know, you can tell when Haydn has caught, has clarinets available, which is in his last stints in London. Mm. So, but they had to learn them on the spot. So he'd sit down and with the guy and say, oh, look, tell me, tell me what the, this instrument can do. Show me. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't necessarily have to know everything, but they did have to have the ability, as we do, to absorb new things. And yes, I agree with you. I don't think we should uh, allow our software to dictate the musical ranges that we write. I think we need to know the fact that the lowest note on this instrument is X and the highest mm. note is Y. And uh, that you know, such things as, for example, it's a little known fact, Stephen, um, that a low C sharp to D trill or D flat to D natural trill on a bassoon that's below the bass clip is impossible. Because of the way the fingering's set up, you can't get backwards and forwards very quickly. A couple of saxophone licks are impossible. Clarinet note combinations, unless you have a particular kind of clarinet system called the full bowen. Yeah. Uh, you can't play. In fact, the Bernstein clarinet sonata, I don't know, you're a clarinet player, aren't you? Yeah. That, yeah. I don't know if you looked at the Bernstein, Bernstein clarinet sonata. I didn't get a chance in my undergrad, but I heard about it. I, I, I learned it from uh, my last year at high school, HSC, BCE exam. And there's an ending bit that goes, la -dee, da 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 -dee. And it's impossible to play on a clarinet unless it has that extra little pinky key that turns it into a full bone system. Um, and so when Bernstein wrote it, which I believe is when he was a student at Curtis, there would have been a, he would have written it for a friend who had a full bowl. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you can't play it. You have to slide in your, with your left hand pinky. And, and you can always hear it when you, you can, un, unlike saxophone where you can slide effectively because as those rollers between the keys, when you're a clarinetist, as you well know, Sliding between the E and the F sharp key or B and C sharp, you always hear in the middle. Right? Yes, As you know, blah, 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 blah. And um, it can't be done. So even even those guys, you know, make mistakes. Well, there was some stuff by Malcolm Arnold, which was uh, very difficult to play. Sonatina, I, I struggled. And the Firebird. 
by mm-hmm. Stravinsky. The I think it was the second movement was it's just awful crossing fingering. Yep, there's a lot of Stravinsky clarinet stuff, but it's all play. It's all possible. Yeah, it's not impossible. It just means that you 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 know you can't go out tonight. You've got to stay home and practice. Ugh. And it's and it's only two bars. And yet, you know, as one as somebody once said, I can't practice this and maintain my lifestyle. But you have to, mm. if you're going to go out and practice, then or stay in and practice, I should say, then that's that's the job you have. It's part of your work. Um, admittedly. It's also a composer's responsibility to write something that is physically possible to play. I used to think it was it was just the composer, the, the, the performer's problem, and they had to find a solution. But no, you know, we've got to find the solution as composers. To is if you like, we give them the problem, but we know what the solution is going to be. Um, sometimes they find better solutions than we have because they know the instrument better. But I think there's a there's a definite oh, it's, there's definitely an onus on us to know the stuff that the software has. I be, I agree with you. Um, my old teacher Donald Erb would have turned in his grave would turn in his grave if he thought any of his students had a cheat sheet for orchestral arrangements or um, hadn't had to keep going to the orchestration book to look at how to write for something. Every so often, it's a bit like being a lawyer. You might have to look something up. Uh, but right now, I couldn't tell you where my orchestration book is because I haven't I haven't used it in ages. I uh, it's all stuck in my head. Go. I I search it on the internet. <laughs> That's the other possibility. Um, ah, ah. Just Google it. Yeah. Just Google it. Um, but again, though, I say, I don't know where my canon is. Mm. No, it's not up there. Um, it's a different book. It was the same colour and I'm not wearing my glasses, so it looked the same. But um, I don't know where it is because I haven't, I haven't looked at it in years. And there might be, for example, I might want to check the bottom note of a concert marimba, which is F for those of you playing at home. Uh, but if it's not a big, if it's not a full size marimba, where does it go down to? Um, you know, where does what's the bottom note on a xylophone? What's the bottom note on a, on a wood on a, on a on a vibraphone? Those C's that are there uh, is something transposed by one octave or two, mm. and those sort of things you do need to know. I think you really do have to take some time and learn them. And because I think we are very much trapped in the modern mindset of instant learning, instant gratification, instant this. Play the piano in seven minutes. No, no, that's not playing the piano. It's playing a bunch of notes. Um, you can't say somebody who's learned, who's done half a dozen YouTube tutorials is going to be a better pianist than Lang Lang or something, um, because he's put in years, and he's just had his, they've just had their first child, so he was doing obviously something more than practicing. Um, he's practicing until he got it right, but uh, the, the the thing is that that um, we do want that instantaneous uh, result. And sometimes music is not necessarily geared to that. Really good music playing is not so, geared to instant results from study. I tried to learn the violin at sort of a late age. Um, mm-hmm. I was one of those who wanted to start looking at the Paganini and doing the vibrato at a beginner mm-hmm. level, but um, found I just wasn't suited to be a violinist. No, you know, neither was I. Yeah, there's either the fingers are too thick. Mine are too big. Start. Yeah, <laughs> you're a woodwind player. Yeah, yeah. you're a woodwind with thick fingers. Bam, covers the holes. Yeah. But even um, with um, big hands, it was a bit of a disadvantage on the clarinet too, I'd find. I, mean, I think if, you, if, you, if you've got big hands, and I don't, I have small <laughs> hands. Um, I have quite small hands, mm. um, especially for somebody my, my size. I mean, I'm 
in, in the old money, I'm 5'11". Um, and I would have really tiny hands. Um, thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> but for, for us, you know, for me, covering the holes was terrific. Mm -hmm. It was a happy accent because I loved the clarinet. And I started on the recorder and went, I wanted to play clarinet when I got big enough. And sure enough, fingers were all there. It was all great. What about the fast uh, passages? Can you, you find you can move quicker? Oh, that's going to, yeah, it's got nothing to do with finger size. That's to do with uh. the tendon. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that just takes practice and lightness and lack of tension. But the thing about um, string playing is, of course, you need to have, especially violin, you've got to make those really tiny spaces. And if you've got big, thick fingers like us, um, you can't do it. <laughs> however, however, double bass is a different matter. Mm. Um, double bass players have big hands and, you know, they're, they're all bloody gorillas, all of them, you know, even the women and even the men, I should say. Um, they're big, big hand, big, strong, especially your left hand has got to be very strong. Uh, first time I found out about it, I sat in on a, an exam for a double bass player. Mm. And I couldn't work out why he was so out of tune. And the and the, the expert on the panel said, well, he doesn't have any left hand strength. Oh, that makes sense. Um, but there are exercises to build that, but he just yeah. didn't have the left hand strength uh, to play in tune. Whereas I think those of us with you know, big chunky hands would, would do okay with double bass. You gotta push harder yeah. on the strings too, don't you're gonna, you? You're gonna have push down, and but also I think you've got more ground to cover. You know, uh, between between notes, um, the difference in a semitone on a violin is quite marked to the difference of a semitone. When you get all four fingers like this, and that's you know, that's perfect fourth. Whereas I think it's probably more like that on a violin. Yeah. Um, but I think the the, your, your, your point about being suitable for an instrument is well take is well made because again I would not be a very good trumpet player because my lips are kind of thick but I've always wondered if I'd be a decent trombone player hmm. or tuba player yeah I tried to play the cornet in the school band but I was always flat Houston all the yeah, time I, well that, that could be could have been the <laughs> instrument <laughs> Um, some of those school band instruments are a bit dodgy, mm. but you know, did you pull in all? Did anybody teach you to use the tuning slides? No, nah. no, nah. see, there you go. That might have been the fact that all you had to do was push the tuning slides in. Um, but yeah, it could also have been your embouchure being a bit slack. You know, it's mm. a very different embouchure to clarinet. Had that problem in my probably first to second to third year on clarinet, I would be always flat on the throat notes too as well yep. what, what, what instrument were you playing on uh, i was on a uh, yamaha and we, we, we won't mention we won't mention brand names just in case they're terrible was it <laughs> no was it it was a, uh wood okay now it was to do well, with um it's I, I wasn't, sure. yeah i wasn't practicing with the tuner i got a bit lazy yeah but that was so fixed you, i'm sure probably was a little weak on the sides yeah uh, um, I was just to say that uh, when you when you smile playing clarinet, uh, you you're in tune. Mm. You know you need that. It just um, takes practice, Houston. Well, but, yeah, and that takes time, mm. and that gets back to our original point that that most people are actually interested in in getting things now. Yeah, I mean, can can you imagine play the trumpet in five minutes? Mm. No. No, not at all. You can make a sound, but you can't play the trumpet. Mm. Um, and, and and it's the same with other instruments. You can make a sound, other complex instruments. Well, you want to know a funny but, story. I had a, you know what a I, yep. Bond clarinet is? You heard of them? Bond. Yeah. Yes, I've heard of them. Oh, they're a shit box. Anyway, I had my first yep. ever A clarinet. You couldn't tune this thing. It was so flat. The bonds are terrible. You need a different, you probably needed a different tuning barrel. Mm. I tried it and uh, I went yeah. to my repairer, Steve Giordani says he, he won't bother repairing them. They're rubbish. No, no, it's, it, it's 
the best thing to do with those instruments mm. was to go camping. And when you needed firewood, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was good kindling. It was very good. Um, yeah, it, they were pretty awful. The, the, the very first instrument I played on was a lark, mm. Chinese instrument. And they were spectacularly out of tune. Oh. And they, the worst, the worst, the real problem was that they had forgotten or perhaps did never knew that when you hack the tree down, the boxwood down, you have to let it dry out and be thoroughly dead for about 10 years Shit. before you can actually put an instrument together around it. Mm. What they do is they just chop it, you know, put slap on, drill the holes, slap on the keys, stick it in the box and sell it to your cheap. Mm. And so all these cheap clarinets were here in the, in the 50s, 60s and 70s with the word lark on them. And uh, <laughs> the wood was still growing. Oh, good. And uh, yeah, so you'd eventually you'd be taking out the clarinet and it would be like shaped like this because, yeah. you know, all the keys and so on on one side were hampering the growth. So it would grow on the other side. So you'd have these sort of strangely shaped clarinets that were out of tune and so and what were you going to do with them? You couldn't sell them to anybody. So um, the, that was, that was they were the worst ones, those larks. Uh, Amati was, was cheap for a while, but they were all plastic and had a pretty nasty tone, but they were all tuned sharp because mm. they came from Eastern Europe and all the Eastern European clarinets were tuned sharp because of the cold. Um, and you would have two tuning barrels, one for summer, one for winter. And uh, I know I, when I eventually got my pair, as we all had to, of Buffet mm. R13s, which were the Ferraris of the clarinet world in 19, the early 1980s. I couldn't, I was not allowed to play it for about three months. Why? Teach, no, they don't play it. I said, why? She said, because you've got to oil it. <laughs> yeah wood and um i said well so you spend every day for three months oiling the outside and then you take a, a, a rag and pull it through and roll the inside and you know, really really push it hard you have to do that for about three months it was every every day for a month every week for a month and then once a day one then once a month for the rest of its life or something like that. But you had to wait until about three months in. And uh, when you when you finally did, it was it was sweet. It was worth the wait. Yeah, and again, my, uh, that, that thing about waiting for the, the, the perfect sound. My uh, A clarinet is a buffet. It's the, uh, you know, the E12, you know, the bottom. E of series? The yeah. yeah. It's good. I played about two 2,500. It's wood. Mm -hmm. um i've got a Yam yamaha you know the 450 yeah so you've got a mismatch mismatched pair <laughs> on a matched pair was yeah. the you know for a clarinet and any yamaha they want five grand for it yeah i, I, I would get it cheaper with a buffet yeah buffet is fine you know i don't mind buffets um when when i was a student the buffet pair was a little bit under for the r13 was still was a bit under three thousand dollars for a pair mm. and there was one guy who's getting to import them and he was selling them on uh from elfham woodwind center i remember and he was getting them and selling them for 1800 yeah. i think just about every one of us bought a pair from him i worked in a factory for two months three months maybe on my first university summer and got enough to buy a pair of buffet r13s and a car mm -hmm. so those are my two purchases for my summer 
Uh, the Buffet R13 was top of the line. The car was very much a bottom of the line. Uh, it was a, and your older readers will, will your listeners will like, well, this was a 1967 Hillman Hunter. There you go, my first car. Uh, but it was, it was definitely worth the three months that I spent. If you just hold on a minute. The, the uh, clarinets actually outlasted the cases, the, the case it came in. So wow. this is my 1981 um, clarinet. There it is sitting there. The A clarinet's in another bag. Uh, but that, it was nice to have a matched pair mm. because you didn't have to worry too much about tuning. Um, that well, was where I was thinking of a Yamaha and a, and a buffet. There might be a tuning problems between them. I, I look when I when I got my Yamaha overhauled, he made it so much better than it was brand new. Okay, good. Which is because I went to Steve Giordano, did a really good job. Good for him. You know? Yeah, a, a good woodwind player, a good woodwind repairer is like a good mechanic. You mm. know? Once you find you, somebody who's going to look after your car, you're going to stick with them. The same with the woodwind repairs. We had one here in, in Melbourne that's now unfortunately closed. Um, Lewis's music. And Lewis, Rog Lewis, did all my repairs when I was a student and afterwards. <coughs> and unfortunately, he's, just, he's retired and uh, but yeah, same thing. He made he made things sound better than they did when they came in off the shop. No, I think that's just the way a good repair person mm. is. They know the instrument so well, and they know what works, and they have the patience mm. and the eyesight to work with those tiny little screws and uh, all that sort of stuff. I tried um, to do it. I tried to pull my old Bond I, apart. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's probably not a bad thing to pull the bond apart and just not putting it back together again. That's all right. Um, but uh, I've actually never met anybody who's had a bond. Wow, yeah. you, you've just gone. You've just gone into my star uh, star pantheon of. That's clarinet. what I could afford. You had a bond. Oh my god. Mm. Um, yeah, so I couldn't afford anything other than the Marty mm. um, until I went to uni and spent a year playing on this plastic clarinet. Um, and then got the, the buffet and it was like a night and day. It was like getting out of a, a really rough riding um, Datsun 200B mm. um, and um, <laughs> just getting into a brand new slick Renault. Or well, like the, I had another, I, I had a spare, it was the Yamaha, it was the plastic one. It was pretty good. It was like, mm. you know, what you use for the marching band. Yep. So I took it to the repairer. He he did a slight service. He made it like a million dollar Ferrari. Yeah. Well, the pla those Yamaha plastics were actually quite good, mm. and they were ideal for for outdoor playing because they didn't get affected by the cold, mm. the way the wooden ones do. Um, and they, they had a slight cutting timbre, slightly sh um, slightly more high harmonics there. Mm. It wasn't quite the, the low harmonics there, which did well for outdoors. You need those outdoors. You need that extra, extra push and the high and the mm. high, um, uh, high frequencies. And they had that. What um, if you're going to play a, a show inside the Northern Territory where it's muggy all year? Would yeah. you use a wood or a plastic? And it's very hot. <laughs> I'd say. Uh, I'd say. Um, can I sing? <laughs> 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 I don't know really. Uh, I don't know what you have to ask a military bandsman. They're the ones who are very, very good at that sort of thing. They may end up having several, you know. Have you noticed when it gets uh, hot in Melbourne and you got wood, it sort of tightens a bit or it affects Well, you? Melbourne's heat is tends to be very dry. Yeah, even Sydney Paris, too. Sydney's is much more humid. Mm. Uh, but yes, it will it will get a little tighter and drier. And that's where the oil comes in. And you still, you know, you never stop oiling your clarinet ever. Uh, so once once every six months even is enough. Uh, if you've got a wooden instrument, uh, you treat it like a cricket bat. You know, for the the length of time that you that you have it, you you oil it, you keep oiling it until it breaks. Uh, 
until it breaks and half of it goes flying, <laughs> flying across the, the room. Yeah. Um, but no, you, you got to, and you got to, you know, make sure that you rub out all the water tracks that are down the in, inside and so on. It's like having a pet um, that can't do anything for itself, nothing for itself, can't even feed itself. So it, there is a fair bit of, there is a fair bit of care involved. But the thing about this, again, this whole discussion that we've been talking about is just how long it takes for the results to turn up. And we go back to this, this, this whole instant result thing that we want from everything else. And we expect it from everything else. You, I mean, how many, how many people watching this would be incensed if the Uber delivery driver took more than 20 minutes or something, you know, and, and that's, yeah, that's crazy. Mm. That's just crazy thinking that, that you have the, that kind of entitlement. Well, they're talking about drones to be delivering soon. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's crazy. That's, that's nuts. People drones with your food. I wouldn't, you know, it's bad enough. Yeah, some clot, clot on a bike, you know, who's ever so likely to have an accident on a wet, especially when it's wet out like that and go skidding away and there goes your dinner, mate. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm, learn to cook, mm. for example. If, if you're cooking, it might take two hours, but, it, you know, food's there. So I think what we're doing even more so than we used to, as I think we are expecting things to be instant, to be right now, or at least very soon. Mm. And we'll complain till we're blue in the face that they're not. And that's, I think we lose something from, from that. Um, we lose the, a, a number of things perhaps, perhaps we lose the, the, the ability to realize that time actually has more than one use it's not instant, but time actually allows things to grow and flourish. Time allows things to mature. Time allows things to happen in such a way that you can reflect on it. Um, whereas if, you know, you're not going to get to reflect much on your dinner if it just turns up on the doorstep. You know? mm, exactly. Whereas, whereas if you cook it, you think, how many different ways can I cook this? <laughs> To well, make it's a different like night. um nobody becomes a Ricky Ponting overnight, you know. How many how many times did Bradman hit that golf ball with the <laughs> with the with the stump, you know? Or or as we just found out recently about Ash Barty mm. when her parents were uh, renovating their house, they took out the garage and there's this duct tape across the brick wall, which is at the approximate height of a tennis net. Mm. And apparently she spent hours and hours out there with a tennis ball practicing getting it over the net you know that's not something that happens instantaneously mm. that's years and years and years of playing and years of preparation and do you do that what's been we, um are you still playing clarinet or what what's what's happened with I'm you i'm not doing much clarinet playing now um did you get in, injured or something like that i was injured back in 87 and uh, what happened was, although I came back fairly quickly uh, and won an audition to do to play in the Victorian State Opera Youth Company, Youth Orchestra, which was terrific. I was the principal bass clarinet, so that was great. And that would have I would have stayed on there, except what happened was the injury was a cut uh, right through this tendon area. But what happened shortly after was that the nerves started to die back and I started to lose all feeling in this area. And the ability to do this, which when you're a clarinet player, it's a very useful thing to be able to do because it opens two octaves of the instrument to you mm. or saxophone, flute less so, but you still could, I still couldn't move my thumb properly. And it took four years to recover. Now, four years is a long time. It's a lot of practice for other people to be doing while you're doing nothing. Mm. And um, when I first tried to come back, the first concert I did was the Peter Towerden clarinet sonata. And I realized I, I just could not practice it enough without my hand 
getting tired. But by then I, a master, I had a master's and a PhD in composition and another master's in choral conducting. So I was, I was on that line, on that trajectory. Mm. But along came the concept of improvisation and, um, and less practice time, but knowing the instrument as I do, creating a new way of playing the instrument. And so we, we for years, had a group in, in Wollongong called the Wollongong Anarchist Noisemakers Collective. Uh, the word collective was spelled with a K, so mm -hmm. I need not tell you the initials were W-A-N-K. Um, and we, we worked together for about 10 years and we've all seemed to have migrated over a period of time to Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, and so here we're not called the Wollongong Anarchist Noisemakers Collective anymore. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, we actually are called third rail and because uh, you touch the third rail you die you know? mm. um so that's um, third rail gigs come up every so often i do a little bit of teaching of clarinet sax and flute when necessary um, but most of the time i'm not playing uh, and i'm conducting or composing or reasonably acting a lot a lot more than i was mm. and doing a bit of stand-up comedy and that's how I spend my days. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I do some teaching uh, at uh, Australian Catholic University, a couple of hours, a couple of days a week. And um, I live in the skies above Footscray, <laughs> um, which is a lovely place to live. Uh, you know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes from the city. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. With a great view of the skyline out there. And uh, yeah, it, and right by the uh, Maribyrnong River. Which today looks like somebody is there's so little there's no wind there seems to be no tide at the moment in either direction no mm. tidal flow and it looks like somebody has just put tin foil down there mm -hmm. it's like a model village down there and that's a tin foil river down there quite beautiful um yeah. it'll it'll start the first the tidal flow will start in a couple of a couple of hours probably upstream mm -hmm. um but uh, yeah i'm i'm rather enjoying not being a clarinetist, I suppose. Uh, but oddly, the, the YouTube video that was, was put up a couple of days ago did in fact talk a lot about my clarinet playing. And, you know, how I've seemed to have written a fair bit for clarinet and most of it seems to be performed somewhere. Uh, and and then I, must, I may well have a natural advantage over other composers. Yeah. I think it was 12 clarinet pieces out of my group list of 90 or so that were published. 12 of them have. Yeah, or, look, uh, that's amazing if you can get your work performed in public or at the Opera, opera House. Um, have you played in any symphony orchestras professionally? Oh, yeah. Um, I played in, well, symphony orchestras and also pit orchestras. Yeah. Pit. Um, that was in, you know, the Victorian Opera, State Opera Youth Orchestra. There was a, I was playing in the musicals for uh, National Music Camp in the United States. Um, played a couple there. Um, played in a couple of pickup orchestras as mm -hmm. well. But most of that was before 1987 when the accident happened. Um, I don't think I've played in an orchestra probably for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. I've been standing on the podium waving my arms in time to the music um, I, the I, closest uh, i got i i auditioned for the uh sydney symphony fellowship that's uh that was i didn't get get through that but i've played in some community orchestras uh mm. played in the orchestra at the where i studied hansel and gretel was the biggest opera i did i was mm -hmm. transposing horn parts so those are my achievements although i've never been paid uh professionally to do it mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um yeah, well, shot. Where, where, where do you live now? I'm in uh, Brinjelly, well, Sydney, Western Sydney. Western Sydney. Yeah. Is there a good, I mean, there's obviously a good community orchestra yeah. there somewhere that you could join. You used to play for the Campbelltown Fishers Goes to Youth Orchestra. Campbelltown Fishers Go. Oh, Fishers Goes. Yes. Yeah, I know. I know. Really, well, then. It's about the, about the bridge and the ghost of the bridge. Yeah. Mm. Um, do they still, they still run? 
Yeah. But since oh, COVID, well. I think they're, they're cutting back. Well, everyone has. Uh, but down here, things are coming, starting to open up quite well. Mm. And Melbourne, Melbourne is a, is, a, is a city of watchers, a city of, of spectators. Uh, mm. People will go to see anything in this town. Um, we just had the vastly curtailed Melbourne International Comedy Festival, which was just the Melbourne Comedy Festival because mm. uh, there's no international city. But we had that and it went well. Um, people did come out. And so um, I think the same thing will, will happen what nationwide. I'm sure it's happening in Sydney mm. as, as things are opening up there. But you were never quite as locked down as we were. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I think there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to perform. Mm. Um, not, too, not too far from now, not too far just from now. And I think, uh, you know, the community orchestras will come back, community choirs will come back. It'll all be, it'll all be just like it was, except it'll probably be a little standing a little further apart. Yeah. <laughs> the new normal, it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, look, fantastic show with you today, Houston. I'll let you talk to you too.